been loved by you Before I took a breath When I doubted, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made You're an artist and a part of I'm the canvas and the clay And you make all things work together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for
Making something beautiful. You're making something wonderful. You're making something beautiful in me. You're making something wonderful in me. My past doesn't scare you, Lord. You can use it all. Oh, it feels like a second chance. Feels like being born again. Lord, you know me. Lord, you know me. Lord, you know me. not beautiful you're not done with me if it's not beautiful you're not done with me oh if it's not beautiful you're not done with me. Oh, in my life, oh, if it's not beautiful, you're not done with me. Oh, my past doesn't scare you, Lord. Oh, and if it's not done with me, Lord. Oh, if it's not beautiful, you're not done with me. You use it all. Every imperfection, every flaw. Nothing can escape your hold, Lord. No, no. You're not done with me. So I'm not done with you.
Good evening, everyone. If we could all please find our seats, that would be lovely. Thanks, guys. Uh, welcome to church tonight. It's so great to see all these faces out here, hopefully smiling under those masks. Uh, thank you so much for coming, especially with all these restrictions, and we're just so grateful that, yeah, you've made the effort to come tonight. Uh, thank you as well to everyone watching on the live stream. We'd love to see you here next week if you're able to make it. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for coming. We've got a really exciting night ahead tonight. Uh, and Found, which is where we're at, Found is our young adults service, five o'clock on Sunday nights, as you all know because you're here. Uh, but it's our time where, as a group of young adults, we get together and we listen to Bible teaching that is applicable to us as young adults in the 21st century here in Adelaide. It's a great time to, with to get to know some other Christians, other young adults, to dive deep into community and to dive deep into the Bible. And tonight is a very exciting night. I'm very excited about tonight and what we've got planned for all of us here this evening. Uh, we're looking at global missions tonight. Uh, we've got some interviews coming up with Francis and some of our missionaries from all over the world. Uh, we've got Steve Early preaching for us tonight on a global missions-focused uh, passage. And I don't know about you, I don't know how much you guys have thought about global missions. If, like me, a few years ago, you thought that it was something that was done in the past, but now with technology, you know, everyone's got access to the Bible, everyone's got access to Christianity. And global missions, is that really necessary anymore? Or if you think, oh, it's those crazy people who go off into the jungles of the Amazon and share the gospel with people who've never heard it before. And sure, that's a part. But as we'll see tonight, there's a lot more to global missions than that. And so, yeah, I hope tonight that we as Christians can see that global mission is something that God calls the church to, something that God calls every Christian to, whether that's going yourself or whether that's being part of the church who sends these people out all across the world to every nation, tribe and tongue uh, to share the message of hope and good news that we have in the Bible. So that's what's on the cards for tonight and I'm excited, I hope you guys get excited by that. And so to start we will be hearing one of these interviews that I was just talking about between Francis and the Fjording family who are a some missionaries that are connected with our church that we support and have sent out. Enjoy. So I'm Alan Fjording, my wife Kaylee Fjording. 
and uh, we work at ICS Udantani. ICS was started from a co-op school in 1997 and uh, the growth has been such that they were able to start a whole new campus. And so they started uh, up in Udantani, which is about an hour's flight north, northeast of Bangkok. So we've been going now for just one year, we finished our first year. And then northeastern part of Thailand is the poorest part of Thailand, but there's also many wealthy people here as well, and Thai people really want to invest in education. There was actually a need here to not only meet that target group in order to support missionary efforts here as well. So there's been a lot of missionaries that have come to this area previously and moved out of this area, like moved back to Bangkok or gone back to their home countries for schooling reasons for their children. And there have been uh, testimony after testimony of missionaries moving here in the last year because of ICS Udantani. Mm -hmm. When missionaries come to Thailand to have a ministry, it's often to a church plant and it's often to reach and have ministry in amongst or with lower socioeconomic Thai people. A lot of the upper middle class to upper socioeconomic people, families, are not targeted by missionaries. And so uh, ICS becomes that mission field. There's a lot of kind of spiritual oppression in, mm -hmm. in this area. You know, just interacting with some of my students, they're very afraid of ghosts. Uh, I can really see how they're motivated by fear in their lives. For a lot of the ICS Udon students, they've never heard about Jesus mm. before this last year. One of the things that struck me, I think just from being in this culture and seeing how Thai people really love King Rama 9, who passed away a couple of years ago, really getting a sense of what a king means to can mean to their people and the reverence that they had for him and passages like you know he's king of kings and lord of lords like spring to life for me for me uh, uh thai people are much more laid back than than australians are and also uh <laughs> they're highly relational so you know we can get very caught up in the you know in the exactness preciseness of of things um and even also in our beliefs and morality and and what's right and what's wrong and so on as christians obviously we know what those things are but we we almost uh, impose and expect and hold other people accountable for what we believe to be true and Thai people are just they they keep that to themselves and they're very relational and they will engage and love others just because they are others i believe that that demonstrates christ's attitude he loved others first and uh, the truth and morality and all of that came later there's one church that's wholly english uh, speaking we collectively began a fellowship uh, of amongst the teachers and it's pretty informal we would meet in different homes and whoever's hosting it usually will lead we have a discussion of the sermon that we stream and we often have live worship if we are hosting it we have youtube worship so since the covid spike we have been watching city reach yeah it's just that connectedness that community relating is is the enjoyable part and uh, most challenging when we go online because of COVID. For me as a teacher, it's, it's really hard because it's all the work part of teaching without any of the reward part of, of teaching. It's, to, it's all those interpersonal relationships that kind of you don't really have time for finding out what's going on in their lives and then connecting with them kind of in a meaningful way. I would go back to that community and connectedness aspect. So knowing that there is a, a church who cares for us and prays for us and is interested and in what we're doing, those uh, aspects of connecting and relating, communicating. It's a big deal to be to be out here away from home, but to then receive a communication or something that indicates that, hey, we're excited about what you're doing, we're praying for you. Like that's, that's uh, 
Yeah, really encouraging. That's very encouraging. If you happen to be a teacher, uh, ICS is a great place to work. Uh, I feel that God has done more in my life, uh, perhaps, than what I have contributed to uh, the ministry. And, and God has never finished working on us. How cool is it to see that different cultures, different places in the world can pick up on different themes of Christianity, different themes of the Bible, and that they jump out because we're all so different, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We as Christians in the West can benefit so much from other cultures and how they interact with and how they see the Bible. And it's so exciting to hear that um, that is exactly what's happening. And also, how awesome is it to hear that they feel like part of our church and that we should be and can be helping them on their missionary journeys by being in contact with them. We've sent them and we should take that seriously. They're part of our church as well as their church. And it's just so exciting that we can partner with them and be, be part of that journey, be part of what's going on in Thailand. Christians are people who've never heard the gospel, hearing it for the first time. How exciting is that? So now we're moving to a time of meeting and greeting each other. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to get up, say hi to those around you, but yeah, please just respect these COVID regulations. Uh, I know that it's a bit annoying, but hopefully it's also an enjoyable time. Um, so, yeah, a couple minutes now to say hi to those around you. Everyone would be happy to find your seats again, please. And we're just about to watch a second video, this time with, drum roll, while I find it, um, 
Joy Singh, who is someone that we, as a church, again, partner with as they spread this good news of the gospel to all nations. So my name is Joy Tish Singh, but I go by the name Joy, and that's how the, the older City Reach community knows me. I'm married to Janice, and we have an eight-year-old daughter, Bella. We were in Adelaide from 2012 to end of 2014, and after I finished my undergrad at uh, ACM, we went back to our home city, Delhi, India, and I pastored a church as an associate uh, pastor for almost four years, and there I saw a great need for training pastors and the Lord opened an opportunity for us to come to Dallas Seminary. Our plan was to, to finish my graduate studies as soon as possible and then do PhD, go all the way. Lord just put in a desire for me to get back into pastoral ministry. He opened a door for me to go back to my home church, Delhi Bible Fellowship, where I was this time as the lead pastor. We are scheduled to go back to India end of August. I was not born and raised in a Christian family. I was born and raised in a Sikh family, and I was quite staunch. At the age of 21, God revealed himself in a very powerful way, and that's when I became a Christian as an adult. As a new believer, you know, I would often feel the scripture is calling me. It was, it was spooky, honestly. <laughs> and then I saw my pastor preaching and expositing the scripture, and I just fell in love with the idea of teaching the word of God to people. It was only affirmed by the leaders, by the elders, by my mentors that God is calling us. It was also affirmed by Janice's heart. So when we got married, it became sort of a common passion, a joint passion to serve God. In Dallas, everyone is a Christian. There might be Christians on the surface or they might be born and raised in Christian family, but you know, you would rarely find a person who has not been exposed to or influenced by the church. Life here as a Christian is very different. It's harder for you to grow because there is just this idea of mediocrity. One thing common between Australia and Dallas, Texas, where I am right now, is just material prosperity, right? There's a lot of material prosperity. And so why do you need God? Even if you have Christ, why persevere? I'm not a bad person. I'm not doing anything bad to anyone. So why should I persevere and be on a trajectory of sanctification and being transformed into the image of Christ? India is a different ballgame. You need to live as a Christian because majority of the people have not heard about Christ. Your life, you know, needs to exemplify the life of Christ. I think the beauty of diversity in cultures and interaction with the, the diversity that is around us is, is the fact that God is doing something different in their lives, in their cultures, and their perception of God might be slightly different than what you and I have. You experience God in different ways, you know, in different seasons, in different regions. So your experience of God while we're reading the same scripture might be slightly different than my experience of God and how God is working in your life in, in Adelaide, in Australia at large, might be very different than how God is working in India, in Delhi or in Dallas, Texas. So the beauty of Having that diversity is just the rich richness of experience with God that it brings and the richness of just experience of people. You know, if you, if you go to India or the, the continent of Africa, people don't work with the clock. For them, relationships are more important. In the West, clock is more important than relationships. And when you come, bring that together, you just have a beautiful combination of different perspectives and how God has shaped and wired different cultures and people. Our church in India opened up this year, end of January, for only a month, and then it shut down again. While Zoom is a decent substitute, it is not really a good substitute. The global economic downturn has hit India as well really hard. So the giving has gone down. You know, we have staff to take care of. Our weekly attendance before COVID was about 500. Now it's anybody's guess. Pray for us. First and foremost, it's resources. If you want to plant churches in 
in Delhi, in India, you need pastors. Be provision in terms of finances. Within the church in India, people need to stand up and support the church. And I think just pray for the gospel to prevail. You know, some of the people have no idea what kind of evil persists and prevails. We are about to plant a congregation. And all of this happened <laughs> during the last year. A small group of people got together under the leadership of the interim pastor who's there. You know, they got together and started a Bible study in someone's house. And that has grown and grown and grown. So while there have been challenges, it has given people more freedom at the same time to interact and engage and, and be in each other's life more than before. I think God has worked in amazing ways uh, that we could not foresee or imagine. All right. Hey, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Vineet. This is my sister, Som. And how encouraging is it that we've listened to so far? I'm just so encouraged by uh, everyone's heart for God and heart, um, yeah, to make His name known throughout our world as well. And yeah, Som and I are going to now lead you in a song. So I want to invite you guys to stand where you are. Um, yeah, we're going to be singing about the lost um, who need to be saved and how the only way, the only name that has power to save is the great name of Jesus. And so even though you can't sing with us, I invite you to reflect on these words. And as we sing um, tonight, um, please sing from your hearts and let's, um, let's worship our God. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. Oh, condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Everything has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. God in the you are high and lifted up. 
Praise all the world who praise your great name. Your great name. Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty. Defender, my Savior, you are my King. Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty. Defender, my Savior, you are my King. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God in man. So the world who praise your great name, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, the Son of God in men, you are high and lifted up. There's all the world who praise your great name. Your great name. Your great name. You guys can grab a seat. And please turn your attention to the screen. We're going to watch our next interview video. Hi, I'm Joanna Trulene. My parents are with Wycliffe Bible Translators in Papua New Guinea. And I was in Adelaide for, I think it was one year, and then separated by another year. And then there were three more years. So I lived in Adelaide for quite a bit. I have lots of family there. Yeah. And so I went to City Reach for a while and love the community there. You guys are amazing. I'm in Minnesota currently, just for summer break. I'll be going back to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago in a week. Deciding to go to the U.S. for college was really hard. I got so connected to Australia and it was just pulling at my heartstrings and I so badly wanted to go back. So my main decision was based on the fact that Moody Bible Institute was the school I wanted to go to. I just felt very strongly that God was leading me to the U.S. I feel like my view of God, this is based primarily on the MK part and being raised, like having to move all the time and seeing prayers not be answered and just tragedy in the people's, in the lives of the people that I lived around and met. I saw God as kind of an angry God. And that was just me. It wasn't because of the cultures that I was in. Looking back, I can see that the way the people I was around worshipped God really impacted me in subtle ways that I didn't even realize. The people in Papua New Guinea are so communal and so giving and hospitable towards each other. And the way they worship God is the same way. They're just so open and yeah, raising hands and they're not afraid to tell people that they worship God. And I just thought that was really cool. And that's something that was kind of drastically different here in the U.S. because I live in Minnesota and the people here are of like Swedish and Norwegian descent. And so it's very kind of straight laced and you don't do certain things and we don't, we don't dance and we don't really raise our hands and worship. And it's just not something that people here are comfortable with. And I've tried to find a balance in between. I think how people worship God in disaster has really impacted me as well. Even just the materialistic culture in the U.S. and in Australia has been interesting to see because I feel like when you live in a culture like that, you're more likely to rely on those things to like protect you and you're kind of more self-sufficient, you know, and maybe you don't feel like you need God as much. Whereas in other cultures, you need God because there are things that you can't get on your own. And so I think it drives you to be more dependent on God. A missionary kid is the child, the child children of missionaries. I feel like I'm a missionary too. And it wasn't necessarily my choice to be a missionary because it was my parents that made the decision. God knew, and he, he knew that these things, the way I've grown up has been, would have impacted my life. And so for me, it meant kind of just living day to day as a representative of Christ 
And I think that's something that all Christians are called to, but I feel like it looked a little bit different in my situation and maybe more, it was more spoken about. And so I think I grew up with a really clear view of that. I think moving around a lot and having to say goodbye has been really hard and really impacted me all throughout growing up. We moved so many times, like I was on a plane before I could walk. So many goodbyes, so much loss. And so I've been learning how to grieve through that. Growing up, I just kind of put it in a box. And my parents always said to us, you're so good at like moving and adjusting. And I kind of took that on as that's what I'm supposed to be. And I have to be kind of perfect in that sense. And so I think I just kind of put that all in a box and didn't really deal with it. When I came to the U.S., I started to realize how that has really impacted me and how the grief that I felt I never processed. So that's been really hard for me, trying to figure that out and then figuring out how that impacts my view of God. I had a friend ask me, like, are you glad that you grew up as an MK? For some reason, I had to stop and think about it. But I was going through like all the things that have happened in my past, in my childhood, and just all the grief and everything. And my first initial reaction was, like, no, I wouldn't want to do this. But as I've been thinking about it more, I'm just realizing all the things that I learned through the grief. I can look at specific things that have happened and find out what God was teaching me in that moment. And so in that way, I'm so grateful for all the hard things. It's kind of the the struggle of like, my will, but yours be done. I think it's so easy to be focused on ourselves and to think, I have my group of friends, I'm comfortable. I feel like nobody really feels like they truly belong. And so I think it's so important to be the hands and feet of Christ and to walk on over and say hi. If you're just focused on yourself, you can miss out on so many blessings and you can just miss out on what God's telling you. I think it's important to take care of missionary families because they're doing the work of Christ. One thing that just really impacted me was going back to the just walk across the room and talking to people. I had people just come up and say hi to me, which I hadn't experienced in other churches. So I feel like City Reach is amazing in that God just provided friends so quickly coming alongside missionary families and joining with them in friendship and stuff like that is so important. When we first arrived there, people gave us furniture and people that we didn't even know sometimes. And that was just such a blessing too, because like setting up a house is such hard work. I just want to be used by God. I I am learning to trust that he's in control and that his will is better than mine. So in that, there's just a lot of surrender. I have to surrender all my feelings about the future and just trust that he's in control and he knows what he's doing. How lucky we are here. I think from all these different videos, different interviews that we've seen, we can see that it's difficult to be a missionary, difficult to leave your friends and your family and your home and move to wherever God's calling you, to a new culture, to a new language, to a new people group. It's hard. And I think that should, can, should make us stop and think, wow, we've got it so good. But it should also lead us to think, how can we be supporting these people? who have left everything to go and, like Joanna said, be God's hands and feet in the world, to spread his message in places where it's hard. One way that we can do that is to pray for our missionaries, and that's what we're about to do right now. So I would love to ask you to please join me as, as we pray for our missionaries over six. Our sovereign God, our Father, God of all people, God of all tribes and tongues and nations, we come before you tonight and we thank you that you have decided to use us, us broken vessels, us mere humans, to spread this good news of your son Jesus to every corner of the globe. We thank you for the people throughout the ages who have done this, who have given up everything even their own lives, so that people might know you. We thank you for the people who have meant, who have told us, Lord, the good news, that chain of people from from the beginning who have shared this message so that we can be here tonight praising and glorifying your name. And we pray for all of the people who are currently doing that today, anywhere in the world. We pray for pastors, Bible teachers, Bible translators, all of the missionaries 
who are so captivated by the glory of you and the message of the gospel that they are willing to go and to tell people. We pray that you would raise up more and more and more people who love you that much. We pray for ourselves as well, that we would learn how to care for these people that we are sending. We pray that you would show us, give us wisdom in how to love them, how to support them, um, how to help them grieve when things are hard, how to help send them well, that they might know that we love them, that they might feel our support and our prayers. Uh, we pray that you would not let us forget them, as it's so easily done, uh, but that they would be constantly on our minds. We pray especially for the missionaries that we here at City Reach support. We ask that your hand would be on them, uh, that they would be fruitful in their ministry. Lord, that they would do everything to the glory of your great name. Uh, we pray especially for the True Leans who are currently in the US. Uh, we pray for Samuel as he's about to start uni. We pray that you would bless that family. Thank you for all the work that they've done in PNG, uh, the, the blessing that they have been there. And we also pray for Joy, who's going back to India in August. I thank you for the work that he's doing there and the connection that he's had, the way that you've grown and matured him. Thank you for the way that you've provided an education for him. And we pray for all of the people in India who don't know you, Lord, that they might know you through the ministry of people like Joy. And we pray for resources in the ch for the church in India. We pray for pastors, for that the gospel might prevail that your name might go out and people might turn to you and believe. And we thank you that this is happening. We pray for their new church plant, uh, that you would grow it and make it, make it great, but not for their sake, for yours. Uh, we also pray for the souks in India. We pray for the COVID situation, Lord. We can't imagine how hard it is over there, uh, but we thank you for the blessing that they're able to continue their ministry online. Now, we also pray for Roger's shoulder, especially, uh, that you would have your hand of healing, but we, we thank you that you've still allowed them to continue their ministry over there. Uh, we also pray for the Wilsons. We pray for peace and comfort after they've recently had a break-in and their car stolen. Uh, we just yeah, ask that you would be their, their refuge and their strength in this time, that you would have your hand on them and be using them mightily for your name. We also pray, pray for the Fjordings in Thailand. Um, thank you that you've taken them there. Thank you that people are hearing about Jesus for the first time because of their work. Uh, thank you that uh, you are the great God, and we pray that you would overcome all spiritual oppression that is present there. Uh, we just ask that uh, you would overcome, uh, that your power would be made manifest, people would see and turn to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would just be in all of our hearts, that we might be considering whether you're calling us to go or whether you're calling us to send and how we can do each of those things well. We pray this for the glory of your great name and ask that it be glorified forever and ever until people from every nation, tribe and tongue stand around your throne at the end. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. everyone, I'll be reading the Bible for us tonight. The passage is from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Um, no, oh, yeah, it is on the back. Okay. The Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, good evening. Uh, lovely to see you all out. Thank you for braving the winter weather and the COVID restrictions and everything else. Um, 
Steve Early. I'm Steve Early, and uh, Terry and I have been missionaries with SIM in Ethiopia. We were there in Ethiopia for, for 21 years, and I'm still with SIM as a mission, so still a missionary. Um, and really uh, left the United States when I was uh, 23 years old, just a young graduate out of university, to go overseas to Africa, and have been overseas pretty much from that point on. Um, so you can imagine this is a topic about which I have got some feelings and some enthusiasm. Um, and despite the fact that I did spend 25 of those years in Africa, I will try not to do an African thing on you, and I will respect the time that uh, we're meant to be here for, more or less. Um, to start with, however, I want to ask you a question. This is a discussion question. This is for you to talk about um, with whoever you're sitting with, or if you can sort of lean across the aisle and chat a little bit, um, that's fine, do that as well. But this is the question, uh, and it may seem a little awkward, but I'll ask the question, then I'll give you a little context. This is the question. What hinders you from being more engaged in making disciples of all nations? What hinders you from being engaged, for being more engaged in making disciples of all nations? Now, you hear that question, you might be thinking, well, I'm not even sure what that means. That's okay. That can be part of your discussion. You can start off by saying, do you even understand what that question says? But at any rate, uh, don't be afraid to um, explore that a little bit. Or you might say, well, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Uh, that's not clear to me. How, how, how does one go about doing that? That's fine. That can be part of the discussion too. Or you might be thinking, well, actually, if I'm perfectly honest, I'm a little bit afraid. I'm not sure what it would require of me to be more engaged in making disciples of all nations. And that's okay too, as we'll see. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes. Talk among yourselves. And the question is, one more time, what hinders you from being more engaged in making disciples of all nations? Okay, have a go.
Okay, sounds like the discussion's actually going really well. So um, I'm a little sorry to cut it short. And uh, if it's going really well, maybe you should hold the thought. You can continue the, the discussion um, after we finish or as we go on. Um, I asked that question up front because this passage in Matthew, what we call the Great Commission in, in uh, chapter 28 of Matthew, uh, is, is a, typically and traditionally is preached and taught as the, the sending word of God. This is the passage preeminently which speaks to the issue of uh, challenging people to go as missionaries um, to serve the Lord in other cultures and other parts of the world, to take the gospel to all nations. Uh, and it's, it, it seems, well, it, 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 that's not an, uh, an, an illegitimate expectation to bring to this passage. It is. It's very much about going and making disciples of all nations. But there, there are a number of issues in this passage that um, perhaps one step deeper down um, that address the issue of what hinders us. And there are three of those things that I really want to look at from this passage, which, which are there, and which I think not only speak to the context in which this story takes place, the disciples of Jesus and the struggle that they had with getting their heads around what he was telling them to do, but the struggle that we have then, following on from that. And, and so I'm going to read through the first part of this passage again and talk about the first problem, or the first challenge, if you will. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Wonderful, honest comment from Matthew there, but some doubted. In fact, I wonder myself reading this when I read this, if Matthew isn't one of those ones who doubted. He's, you know, he's, he's really sort of giving us an insight. To be honest, I had my doubts at any rate. Um, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So let's talk about the first problem. They doubted. These are, these are, the clo these are Jesus' closest disciples, the people who were with him right through his public ministry. Very close. And now they've seen him rise from the dead and return back. And he's giving them this word. And yet... Matthew gives us this really nice, honest little insight into the hearts and the minds of these followers. Some doubt it. And I think it actually, is a, just as a, a, a word to us, that the fact that worship and doubt can go hand in hand so closely like this is quite reassuring. They should. The more deeply we're worshiping God and the more keenly we're seeking to follow Him, the more it's likely that we're going to butt up against some of the things that, are, that cause us to doubt and that we struggle with. So in their case, what are they struggling with? What's the issue? Well, think about who they are and the setting in which this conversation is taking place. These are preeminently good Jewish men, right? And they come with their very powerful Jewish expectations about who this is they're talking to. It's the Messiah. And they know now better than anyone, because they've seen him rise from, from the dead, this has got to be the Messiah, the promised Messiah of God. And as good Jews, and having this long tradition behind us, we all know what that means. Now, finally, we've been begging him all this time, we've been looking for it, we've been waiting for it, and now finally it's going to happen. He is going to raise up the people of Israel, the people of God, He's going to push out all the Gentiles, especially the Romans. He is going to restore the nation of Israel to the people of Israel and the king in the line of David to the throne of Israel, sovereign once again. In not only that, he's going to restore the name, the honor, the reputation of the nation of Israel to the place that it had during the time of King David. We all know this as good Jews. This is exactly what we expect when the Messiah comes. And we know this is the Messiah. So this has got to be what's going to happen. And what does Jesus say? He says to them, now, what I want you to do is to go and to make disciples of whom? Of all nations. And just think about that for a moment as a Jew. 
if he's talking to you as a good Jew, the last thing you want to do as a good Jew is to interact with the Gentiles. I mean, they're godless, and frankly, they're not even clean according to our, our, the rituals of our, the ritual belief of our faith. So Jesus has won. He's overturned this expectation that he's about to restore the nation of Israel to the people of, of Israel. And so they're, they're really struggling to get their heads around that. It doesn't sound like that's about to happen. But, okay, he is a master. It is typical for a master to tell his disciples at a certain point, okay, it's your turn now. You go out and make disciples. That's okay. This is within our comfort zone, sort of vaguely. But who are those disciples meant to be? They're meant to be the very people from which we're supposed to remain separate. So how can that be? How does that work? And so you begin to understand a little bit why in this setting, people who are listening to Jesus talking to him now are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, it's not supposed to go this way. What he's doing here, of course, is he is challenging very deep-seated expectations that they have about God. And what he's challenging, what he's, he's not just challenging them, he's basically commanding them to do as his followers. He's challenging the deepest levels, their expectations about God. So, my next question for you, and I want you to talk about this again in the same groups. What are the, in this, at this, in this time of your life, what are the deep-seated expectations about God? Or your life, or your futures, or maybe some big question that you have in front of you, what are the big and the deep expectations that you have that you feel God may be challenging? I'll say it one more time. What are the really big, deep expectations that you have? They may be about God or about your life that you have, that you sense, that you feel God may be challenging. So take a few moments and have that discussion, and I'll come back, and we'll come back to the passage, all right? Go ahead.
Okay, good, further good discussion. Um, it looks like maybe if I, if I give you guys another five minutes, you're going to have it all sorted out, I can tell. Um, and then you can tell me, you can explain it to me. Um, okay, so you've had a chance to talk that through. And I hope, and I, uh, well, I do hope it's the case that you're able to share, you know, some fairly honest and open um, areas in, in which you feel like God may be doing just that chipping away at, attacking some of those expectations that you have, probably especially about him. Because that's, that is typical of a life of faith. It's exactly where these people are, these men are at. Uh, just at the point at which they feel like they can, they can tell one another what the next step is likely to be. And they're beginning to feel like they've got a little bit of solid ground under them again, after everything that they've been through, particularly with Jesus. What happens? turned on its head, all those expectations and understanding, turned on its head. We spend an enormous amount of time, energy, thinking, trying to make life predictable, and even trying to make God predictable, because that's, that's important to us, the comfort, the security of knowing what the next step is going to be, and as far forward as we can plan and think to be able to have those expectations, and God is always, always challenging them, sometimes attacking them, sometimes even radically overturning them. Because our comfort in those things and our security in those things is not the most important thing to God. It's our understanding of Him, His understanding that how, who we need to become, the kind of people we need to become to share eternity with Him is the most important thing for us. And that doesn't always include the security of knowing what to expect next. Or even having God neatly tied up and well-defined for our own comfort and for our own sake. And that's what's going on here. These men, having their expectations about Messiah, they've got it all now turned radically on its head. And he's telling them this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you have to ask yourself the question, if these men, the Jewish men that I'm telling you they are, do they really even understand that? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always. I am with you always to the end of the age. So the next problem, the second problem, what is he actually commanding them here? Well, bear with me, we're going to do a little, a, a very little exegesis here. Um, and for some of you, that means you give yourself permission to switch off for a minute. Please don't switch off. It's going to be short and painless, I promise you. But what does the passage actually say? Let's go to the heart of it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This is the classic missionary passage, right? Go. It was preached for me at my commissioning as a missionary way back when in Seattle, Washington. And probably at some point in every missionary's career, they have this passage preached for them, or they preach it, or it's always there as the challenge to go. But the passage doesn't actually say go. That's not a command in this passage. Some of you may have read this, you may have studied it, you may know it. Um, and just so you don't take my word for it, I'm going to call upon our resident linguistic expert here to unpack some of this for us. But Lockie Hodgson, go in this passage, it's a passive participle, right? So that's not go, it's not a command. How would you translate that into English? Like go? Going. So it sort of starts off going, therefore. And the next part, Make disciples of all nations. Second person, plural, imperative. Second person is y'all. Second person, plural, so it's not just you, Jesus talking to one of these people, one of these disciples. He's talking to them as a group. You all make disciples, or disciple. The word is literally ma teteos. Make disciples, or disciple. Second person, plural, imperative. This is the command. 
The only command in this passage is make disciples of all nations. And everything else is in a different case. Why, why is that important? Because, for two reasons. The making of the disciples is what he's telling his disciples to do. And he's not telling them to do this as individuals. He's telling them to do this together. This is Jesus speaking to his church. So the second problem that we have, that we come to this passage with often, in terms of our own thinking, is we tend to think of the missionary calling as very much a solitary individual calling. And you've got to be a real strong, independent person to respond to that call, to Jesus' command to go and make disciples. But if we understand this passage and the context, the setting of it, I think, perhaps a, a little better, a little more deeply, what is actually happening here is Jesus is speaking to his church. And he's saying, this is your job now. I'm giving this, I'm passing the baton on to you now as a church, as my church. And so the challenge, the task, maybe even the, the, the somewhat intimidating prospect of going to make disciples of all nations this isn't something that we're told to do as individuals. It's something that we're all called to as the church. And you heard some of those missionaries' testimonies talking about how they're able to do what they do because there's a church behind them. Not just behind them, but with them. And think about the people to whom Matthew is writing. Matthew, now. Matthew's telling this story, right? Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and Matthew's telling the story about Jesus speaking to his disciples. To whom? To the church. To this church of mainly Jewish believers, probably in and around Jerusalem, who are heavily persecuted because they're followers of Jesus. They're Jews, but they're followers of Jesus. They believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And Matthew is saying, this challenge which was passed to us as his followers is now yours. You're the church. You are those disciples. Now make disciples. So what we need to pick up from this is, again, the, the, what's in, in the mind of Jesus as he's giving this command. He's not calling any one of you to do this on your own. He's calling all of you, all of us, together to do this as his church, to make disciples. Important distinction. And no one who ever does this ever does it alone successfully. It wasn't meant to work that way. It doesn't work that way. But let's move ahead what, to what I think is the best part of this passage. So you've got these guys standing there now totally befuddled, thinking, ah, oh, I just, just when I thought I had it all worked out, now he's telling us to go make disciples of all nations. And, and he's going to leave us to do that on our own. Now, Jesus understands something here that they don't quite get yet, but they will, of course. It's coming. He knows that the very next thing, the significance of the very next thing that he's about to do is, is, is built into this, which is he's about to ascend to heaven. And why is, that in, why is that so important? Because if he doesn't ascend to heaven, Jesus can only ever be at one place at one time. And when he does, it means that he can be, he can fulfill what he's just promised them. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that's the critical part. That's the part that makes all the rest of this possible. I am with you. What does that look like? Well, let me tell you a story. 23, 24 years ago, one of our missionary friends, um, as a mission, we were, working, we were working to reach an unreached people group in a very remote part of Ethiopia, in the far southwest corner of Ethiopia, down in the uh, Omo River Valley. The Me'en people, Me'en people. And one of our good friends and colleagues was was the, the missionary sort of in charge of that work. He was, he was doing most of the work to reach those people. He had studied the language, worked very hard at learning it so he could communicate to the men and people in their own language, had studied their culture, lived with them, had learned a lot about who they were and how they thought, and he'd begun to share the gospel message with individual communities 
And he was really amazed. He was surprised at just how responsive the man seemed to be. Everywhere he went, it wasn't, I mean, you can be a missionary, you can work in a, in a community or in a, among a people group for your whole life and never see a single convert. That wasn't, it wasn't like that for Ben. He was, everywhere he went, people were saying, yeah, we want to hear, we want to hear the message. And they were responding and they were coming to faith through the message, through the gospel. To the extent that the, some of the remaining communities or people that he was trying to reach were very, very remote. They were way down in the Omo River Valley, far from any roads, far from any established villages. They were cattle herding nomadic people. They moved all over that whole valley region. And to, to get to them was quite challenging. Several days of trekking, if you're going to do it by foot. Fortunately, uh, Ben was able to, to work with a, a mission, another mission agency that had a helicopter. And they were able to fly him in and out of that, that region to some of the more remote places by helicopter. And in one large community, where Ben had shared the gospel and he met with a really, really enthusiastic response. He promised the people they were desperate that he would keep teaching them because they wanted to know more. He said, look, I'll come back. I promise I'll come back. And he gave them a time and a date when he would do that and made the arrangements. And when the time came, he went back, flew back in that direction with the helicopter. But when he visited there originally, they didn't have GPS coordinates for where that community was. And these are nomadic people, so even if they'd been there one week, there's a good chance they're not going to be there the next week. Going back to try to find these people, flying with the helicopter and the helicopter pilot, they're looking through the region, trying to find this group of people so that he can follow through on his promise, and they can't find them. And the helicopter pilot says, look, we've, really, we've only got about another 15 or 20 minutes of fuel before our, we're going to have to turn around and go back. And he, he was really disappointed because uh, these people were desperate to hear more about Christ. Well, they talked about it. They said, the, the pilot said, look, let's do this. There's a group of, there's a community down there. You can see there is a large group down there. It's not where it was supposed to be, but let's go down there and let's see if those people know where this village is. And maybe they can at least point us in the right direction. So they land just outside the village. And they're amazed because there are actually quite a few people around, which is unusual. Most of these people are out during the day looking after their cattle, watering them, moving them from place to place. And they don't sort of stay in the village. They're, especially during the day, they're scattered all over the place. But there was a large group of people in this particular spot. And when they landed, the, the chief, the head man of that, of that village, of that community, he came forward basically before they could say anything. And he said, welcome. He said, the people are all here. And Ben said, okay, um, why are the people here? And he said, they've come to hear the message. And he said, how did you know I was coming? And they said, the head man of the village said, well, um, I was told that you would be here. And the pilot and Ben are looking back and forth at each other at this point. Ben is totally confused, like, I know this is not the place. These aren't the people. I have never been here before. I don't know who these people are. And the head man repeated him and says, no, no, no. The people are all here. I called them all together because they're here to hear the message. They're waiting to hear the message. So Ben starts to twig that something's going on here. And he says, how did you hear that the message would come? He said, well, I had a dream three nights ago. And in my dream, a voice told me that a messenger would come from the sky to bring the people the word of Christosi, their word for Christ. The, the, the word of Christosi, the news of Christosi. He would come in three days. He would come from the sky. And that I was to have all the people here that so, that, so that no one was left out. So we're all here. We've been waiting for you all day. This is the third day, and you came from the sky. So he shrugs his shoulders like, okay, let's get on with it. And Ben and the pilot, as he's explaining this to the pilot, are thinking, whoa, this is, this is amazing. This is incredible. And they, they basically sort of looked at each other and thought, well, that's it for our plans. We know we're supposed to be here. Let's tell the people about Christosi. And they did. He spent hours going through the gospel message with the people in that community. And at the end, the headman 
turned to Ben and he said, is there anything to stop us from being, from, from believing? It's the expression that he used, from any rate, from accepting Christ. And Ben said, there's nothing to stop you. So they did, as a whole community, as a whole village, on the spot, they accepted Christ. And as, as I recall, Ben and the helicopter pilot ended up having to spend the night there because it was so late by then that they, they couldn't fly out. Pretty incredible, though, right? Uh, contrary to all of their plans or expectations or anything that they were thinking, God had already orchestrated this to happen so that the message could go to those people in a way that was unmistakably of God. And this is the picture of what it looks like for Jesus to be with his disciples as they make disciples. This is the thing he wants his disciples to understand. Yes, I'm not going to be physically present with you. You won't see me eye to eye like you do now. But I'll be with you in a, in a powerful way and in a very real way. And you're not going to do this alone. Not only are you in this together as a church, you're in this together as a church with me. And that's the point. This is what it looks like when we as a church say yes to Jesus when he says to us, make disciples of all nations. The thing that's close to his heart is the place where he will be. And we'll find him there. We'll find him there. One of the other things that I hope you picked up from uh, what the uh, missionary shared was Jesus could have done this any number of ways, of course. Um, some that would have been much more dramatic and probably from our standpoint would appear to be a lot simpler. Why did he set this small group of people, of disciples, and, and even going on a step or two, the, the, the church as it grew, why send people to do this? Why send this small group to, to, to try to spread the word, the gospel, throughout the whole world? And I can't tell you the answer to that question. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I don't know that I fully understand that myself. But what I do know and what I have seen, and probably what I'm a witness for myself, is very much what you were hearing some of those others share, which is this. That when we go as disciples to make disciples, what we discover is the reality of the fact that Jesus, is, of course, is with us. Sometimes in powerful and miraculous ways, certainly in wonderful ways, in ways that we could never have anticipated or expected. Because a part of this, of course, is just that, the overturning of those expectations. But he's with us, and we will discover just how he's with us. But he's not only with us, he's already there. He's been there. He's been at work. And at least part of the value of why this is important for us to be engaged in and for us as a church to be engaged in is because what we will discover as we make those disciples of all nations is what God has already taught them about who he is and how that will change us. Change us as his followers. Change us as his church. And again, I don't understand fully all of the mechanics of this and how it all works, or even why, in all respects, it needs to take place. But I do understand this. For some reason, that's very important to God. That we won't be isolated in our understanding of who he is and how he works and what he's done by our own culture but that we will rediscover again and again the complexity, the wonder, the miraculousness of it, and the beauty of what he has already done as he sends us out to make disciples of those nations. And for some reason, that's really important to him. What I can say is, it's amazing. And that's the part I, I guess I'd really like to leave you with. Yes, it's a scary thing to contemplate taking up that call to go, to be the one to do the going, um, and to make disciples of all nations. Sure, it's challenging, it's difficult, it's scary, it's all the things that you could imagine it would be, but it is an adventure. It's an amazing adventure. Hanging on to the coattails of God as he goes about doing what only he can do and what he loves to do, 
and is absolutely committed to doing. And then seeing how he will change other communities, other nations, and he will change us as well. So the last question I'm going to leave you with is, and I want to turn this around now from the difficulties and the challenges to the, to the wonder of it, the great, the exciting part. If you could make disciples of any nation, if you had the opportunity, what nation would that be? Share with one another. If you could make disciples of any nation, you personally, if you could be sent to make disciples of any nation, what nation would that be? So I'll let you have that discussion. Um, since I'm done here, let me pray for you before you do that, and then we'll give you a little bit of time to have that conversation, um, and then we'll carry on with the service, all right? So let me pray for you. Father, we, we do thank you for the fact that um, there's so much about what Jesus tells us, what Jesus tells us in this passage as his people in this day and age that is meant to reassure us. And along with all the stuff that we don't fully understand or that, or that if we're perfectly honest, any one of us individually might find a bit intimidating uh, or challenging to put ourselves in the shoes of those first disciples and think what it would mean for us to be given this command and then to follow through with it. Despite all of that, Father, what we, what we, what we thank you for is that the evidence even here and everything that's happened from that point on to reassure us and to remind us of the fact that you haven't abandoned us to this alone. You've given us one another. You've given us the opportunity, the challenge, the invitation to do this together. And that somehow in doing this together, who we become as your people is that much more a testimony of what you're like yourself. Closer, more loving, more committed to one another, more deeply understanding of each other, more respectful of the gifts you've given us collectively. But especially the fact that you are with us. You're with us in this. This is so important to you, so close to your heart. And we... We do pray and we do ask. We ask this as a church, that whatever part of this you set apart for us as a church, that we wouldn't miss out on it. And I pray especially for the younger people here in this room with me tonight, the ones that you are preparing to discover exactly what this means in ways that they couldn't imagine or expect or any of us could anticipate, that no one would miss out on that opportunity and that for each one, the place that you've given us, we'll find it and we'll respond, trusting you to be with us. And I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So just a couple minutes. Where would you go? What nation would you make disciples of? Okay, thank you very much.
All right, everybody. Um, we're going to continue um, singing now. So if you'd like to jump up to your feet again, again, we're sorry you guys can't sing along with us. But, um, yeah, please listen to the lyrics and, yeah, respond in your hearts in, um, yeah, in the way that we can uh, with COVID restrictions right now. Um, yeah, let's sing. I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. Yeah. I see. Love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sin, the people sin. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna.
say. Well, thank you, Vanith and Som, for leading us uh, in worship. Thank you, Steve, for bringing us the message tonight and reminding us that, for encouraging us, for challenging us, for reminding us that Jesus is with us always. Wherever we go, wherever we go he's with us and he's already been there. If this service tonight about global mission has raised any questions for you, if it's piqued your curiosity, your interest, um, come and have a chat to someone. I'm sure Steve would love to have a chat. Francis would love to have a chat. I'd love to have a chat. I'm sure Ollie would love to have a chat. Find someone. Tell someone. I would love to encourage you to keep discussing this, keep pursuing this um, after the service with, with those around you. Um, and whether that's you want to be a better sender or you're considering your feel that God's calling you to, to go. Uh, we'd love to pray through that with you and we'd love to chat through that with you. Uh, this Wednesday night, we also have a engaging other cultures, how to engage other cultures training night uh, for our young adults. would love to see you all there. It'll be an awesome night. We've got a panel of people from different cultures who are going to share a bit about engaging with their culture and take some questions too, I'm sure. That's going to be awesome. Um, lots of fun. Hope to see you there. Next week, we're starting a new series in Romans 7 and 8 called Anchors. So come along next week to hear all about that. It's going to be very exciting too. And 18th of August, we have a City Reach Young Adults Worship Night. So hopefully we'll be able to sing by then. Uh, but that come along for a time of just yeah, gathering together as the body of Christ, and praising our Lord with song. So, yeah, I would just love to pray to finish us off tonight as we go out into this week. Um, pray that we might, yeah, be challenged by God, by what we've heard tonight. So if you'd join me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message you've given us tonight. Thank you for how your first disciples took your command seriously and have made disciples, and those disciples have made disciples all the way to us today. Uh, we pray that you would give us a heart to continue that process, to continue that line of making disciples, whether here or of all nations. We, we ask that you would be, be at work in us, that we, might, that we might do that. Now that as we've just heard sung, that you might give us a heart, that we would give everything for your kingdom's cause. Uh, we pray that over this next week, um, as we go about our lives, we would be glorifying to you and making disciples uh, as you lead us to. Uh, we, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to, to hear from your word, to gather together, and pray that you would be glorified by the discussions that come after this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. See you on Wednesday. Also, we don't have any supper or anything after the service, but would love to encourage you guys to hang around and chat. But again, COVID regulations, please. Thanks. So I know you are here right now. And if